Today on Straight Talk Africa, we look at some stories and events that made headlines in 2014 on the mother continent. The Mandela Washington Fellowship, the significance of the first ever U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, and political transitions in Burkina Faso and Zambia. And yes, international and local efforts at managing the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. That's coming up next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. It's Wednesday, January 7th. I am Shaka Sali. A terrific and happy new year to you all. Well, Happy New Year to all of you as well, uh, to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I am Maria Madiello, your social media reporter. Today, we'll reflect on some of the top stories that dominated the headlines on the African continent in the past year and look ahead to what it's in store for 2015. Lots to delve into today, Shaka, coming up later in our STA inbox. Our audience has written to tell us what stories meant the most to them in 2014 and what's important to their lives moving forward. We'll reveal some of them ahead on Straight Talk Africa. But first, Africans will most likely defer on the list of the continent's many impactful events of 2014. My colleague Paul Sisko has more. The biggest story on the continent in 2014 was undoubtedly the West African Ebola epidemic, the largest in history. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea were the three hardest hit countries with over 13,000 laboratory confirmed cases, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The virus is still spreading, and nearly 8,000 people have died in those three nations. Thanks to its rapid response, Nigeria, however, was able to quickly stop the deadly disease there. Nigeria is sub-Saharan Africa's most populous country, and it now boasts the continent's largest and fastest growing economy, surging past South Africa in 2014. However, the terrorist group Boko Haram intensified its violent insurgency in northeast Nigeria with repeated bombings, shootings, and abductions. The militant group also expanded its violence beyond Nigeria's borders in 2014. As we enter 2015, the group's reign of terror has displaced over a million citizens, with nearly 300 Chibuk schoolgirls still missing. Elsewhere, it has been tough going in South Sudan, despite endless proclaimed ceasefires, talks, and negotiations. Meanwhile, what observers believe was an attempt to overthrow Gambian President Yahya Jammeh was foiled on December 30th. The United States, United Nations, and African Union are calling on all parties to maintain peace and calm. President Yahya Jammeh himself seized power in the small West African country in 1994. He has long faced criticism for his human rights record. Gambia is one of the world's most oppressed and isolated nations. Africans witness rapid leadership change in Burkina Faso, where President Blase Compari abruptly resigned after two days of massive protests triggered by attempts to seek an unconstitutional third term. In Zambia, President Michael Sata died suddenly October 28th, elevating former Vice President Guy Scott to acting president. Zambians are poised to vote for a new president on January 20th. U.S. President Barack Obama hosted the first ever U.S. African Leaders Summit in August, bringing 40-plus African heads of state to Washington, D.C primarily to expand trade relations. And the Young African Leaders Initiative brought 500 Yali Fellows from 47 African countries to America to network, study, and gain work experience. The program is now called the Mandela Fellowship for Young African Leaders. It is expected to continue for years to come. Among the many highlights for us here on Straight Talk Africa was the visit of Sarah Obama, President Obama's paternal grandmother. Our audience engaging Ebola, Knowledge is Life town hall special held in November. And Straight Talk Africa's Ali Missouri tribute. The legendary scholar and political thinker died on October 12th. He was 81. Paul Sisko, 
VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Uh, now, joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests, Dr. Darius Merns, president of AfriCare, a non-profit organization based here in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining AfriCare, Dr. Merns served as acting chief executive officer of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, or MCC. I have to say, frankly, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time, Dr. Manz. Thank you, sir. You're most welcome, sir. Mulegwa Zihindura, president of the Center for Political and Strategic Studies and the former spokesperson for DRC president, Joseph Kabira. Hey, Mulegwa, how have you been, man? We're doing fine, uh, Brother Shaka. Good to see you this morning. This well, good to host you again <laughs> on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and this time, of course, uh, right from the Washington studios. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, How does it feel for you? Oh, it's beautiful. You know, the weather is beautiful here. I like the cold weather, so I'm, I'm, I'm at ease. I feel very... Uh, I see. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Henry Gombia, publisher and editor of the London Evening Post, an online newspaper based out of the United Kingdom. He joins us from our London studios. Hey, Dr. Gombia. Well, I gather that uh, they are trying to uh, fix some technical difficulties. We'll be able to bring him on later. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is one. Let me come to you immediately. Um, Dr. Manns, when you look back to 2014, what immediately comes to your mind, really, in as far as uh, Africa is concerned, if you thought about the highlights? When I look back at last year, I think Africa very much was put in the spotlight globally. Mm -hmm. On the negative side around the peace and security challenges in the continent, whether it was the challenge of Ebola mm -hmm. or the problems of the conflicts in the north of Mali, South Sudan, Central African Republic, so many. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, much of that coverage was negative. On the positive side, there are many great things that happened on the continent mm -hmm. that I think bode well for 2015. When you look at the progress that was made on the economic front, uh, one small example of that was the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit mm -hmm. with the spotlight on Africa, $33 billion of investment being committed. Mm -hmm. I gather that uh, yesterday uh, you were one of the 40 uh, people uh, that uh, somehow interact with Africa that were invited to the White House. Yes, and it was an opportunity to take stock of what happened at the summit mm -hmm. and the business forum and to talk about what happens next, how to sustain that momentum, to keep that spotlight on Africa, to ensure that going into 2015, mm -hmm. that message does not get lost because some things have changed since the summit. We had midterm elections in the United States. Now, with Republicans uh, in control of both the House and the Senate, mm. I think that's an opportunity on the Africa agenda. Africa is one of the things that I think both sides of the aisle can actually agree on. So we're hopeful that we see passage of AGOA as a result. Were you uh, very optimistic based on uh, what you had uh, from uh, the policymakers there? Because there are a lot of skeptics, frankly, who are saying that uh, it's just talking the talk. There's no walking that talk. I think the administration has committed itself to showing people that this is going to be different, that this momentum will continue. I look at the Doing Business initiative on mm -hmm. Africa being mm -hmm. run out of the Commerce Department. I look at the investments that are being made to start putting people on the continent. OPEC for mm -hmm. the first time is going to have somebody sitting in Abidjan shortly right. to make sure that there is a real follow through mm -hmm. in, uh, the, on the trade and investment agenda. So I, I think, you know, I certainly hear the focus on Yali to make sure that this continues well beyond this administration. So I, I certainly hear from the administration a determination that Africa does not get lost on the agenda because they recognize 
Africa has lots of choices today. I think that's the big story of 2014. Very interesting. Not only the summit in Washington, but African heads of state were in a number of capitals around the world. Very shortly, the sixth FOCAC in China will mm -hmm. take place, mm -hmm. where I guarantee you the Chinese will announce $33 billion plus plus. Malik, well, what about the importance of what uh, Dr. Mann is uh, referred to as YALI, which in fact now is known as the Mandela Washington Fellowship? What about that? Uh, is that the answer, for example, given that uh, U.S. President Barack Obama back in 2009, he addressed Africa from the Ghanaian capital, Accra, mm -hmm. and said that Africa does not need strong men. It needs strong institutions. Yeah, you know, correct. You know, I think, uh, you know, let me dovetail on what, uh, what he said, uh, what my colleague on my left said. Um, we've seen a lot of good things happen in Africa now. There's a lot of economic boom and so on and so forth. Now, since August uh, of 2014, uh, we have seen the United States for once really focus on Africa. Uh, with the U.S.-Africa Leadership Summit, uh, where I was here in Washington uh, myself, uh, we've seen uh, the focus. And indeed, uh, President Obama is right. Uh, what we need in Africa is to build strong institutions. Uh, we need to bring uh, strong institutions because, you know, people are human beings. You know, they come and go. Uh, like uh, we say, uh, you and I have discussed in the past, uh, the only thing that is permanent in life is change. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything else, you know, will come and pass. So we can't uh, uh, just uh, focus on certain individuals, you know, because after some time they'll be gone. And President Obama was right. And, and for this fellowship that he's doing now, empowering, if you could, uh, future African leaders, that, uh, that's very important, you know, uh, investing in the future. It's not the only thing that needs to be done. More needs to be done to ensure that uh, we are invest investing in a lot of people in Africa, especially the young and so on and so forth, to, to take over in the future. What about uh, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, namely Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia? What would you say about... Uh, the you know efforts to manage the pandemic so far especially from the african perspective well first of all let me say that this was an atrocity this pandemic was terrible uh, it was horrible it's something that we've lived through already in the democratic republic of congo in the past and so uh what happened actually in west africa is something that has happened to us but we were able to deal with it because it tried to come to one part of the democratic republic of congo but our people were ready uh, our doctors were ready. We had a system put in place already in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our Ministry of Health worked overnight. Uh, they quarantined the area already uh, where this problem had begun. And so we were very prepared. So uh, unfortunately, that was not the same thing for other countries in Africa, like Liberia. We've seen what has happened in, in Sierra Leone. Tons and tons of people have died. Uh, families have been decimated. A family of seven, you lose four people, and so on and so forth. So it, it was very, very atrocious. But one thing, though, that, that comes to my mind is what happened in Liberia. Many Liberian politicians began to flee the country, actually. You know, these were people that were politicians, you know, were begin to flee the country instead uh, of, of staying with the population and staying at home and try to look to, to seek for a solution. So this pandemic was terrible and uh, it was really, really bad for Africa. And uh, uh, thank God in Congo we were ready for this. But how come you were not able to share your expertise with your brothers and sisters in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea? We did. We actually did. Uh, a lot of the doctors from the Democratic Republic of Congo were actually sent uh, to Liberia and to Sierra Leone to, to help them. To this day, many of our doctors are still there helping them. And I am very grateful that we could contribute uh, to the health care in those countries. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter. And we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA 2014 Africa Review. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa, become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. 
let's take a quick look at Africa 2014 year in review. The West Africa Ebola epidemic began in December 2013 in Guinea, later spreading to Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and Senegal. Nearly 4,000 people have died from the disease. In January 2014, Fighting between supporters of President Salva Kiir and his former deputy Riek Machar continue in South Sudan. On the 20th of that month, Katerin Samba Panza is appointed as interim president of the Central African Republic, replacing former Seleka leader Michelle Jotoja. In February 2014, Kenyan actress Lupita Nyong'o wins an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her work in the film 12 Years a Slave. In April 6, 2014, Nigeria's economy surpasses South Africa's as the largest on the continent. On April 14, Nigerian terror group Boko Haram attacks a school in Chibok, abducting 230 school girls. Dozens escape, but nearly 200 girls are still missing. Sia Niyama Karoma, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, speaks to VOA on the Ebola crisis. I would want the people in West Africa to know that Ebola is real. Ebola kills. Early detection and prompt treatment can save lives. And I'm asking our people not to victimize or stigmatize survivors. Ebola is a challenge, but together we'll all be able to overcome it. That was Sia Niyama Karoma, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, speaking to VOA Africa on the Ebola crisis. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui. Let me come back to you. Uh, um, Dalias, you said uh, you wanted to comment something on uh, the Ebola epidemic? Yes, uh, colossal failures globally, mm -hmm. uh, as well as challenges of leadership on the ground. The good news is you see the numbers in Liberia are coming down. That's because of the way in which the government has stepped up with the support of the United States and others, but also, very importantly, Africans, mm -hmm. neighbors, mm -hmm. countries like the DRC, mm -hmm. and others from the African Union who are sending health care workers. Mm -hmm. When Ebola hit, Africare had been working to strengthen community-based health systems. We immediately swung into action. We mobilized resources to get personal protection equipment to healthcare workers, to keep health facilities open so that people could be treated for non-Ebola-related diseases that were killing people because the hospitals were simply overwhelmed. Now we see that there is a very big push under the leadership of the government to strengthen health systems. So I think what we will see in 2015 mm -hmm. is West Africa beginning to emerge from the Ebola mm -hmm. crisis mm -hmm. and not just simply rebuild, but build back much better these healthcare systems which were so fragile you're right, the but crisis. You're right in saying, of course, that uh, the numbers are going down in Liberia, but what about in Sierra Leone? They seem to be rising up. Absolutely right. And, and something of a roller coaster ride in Guinea where the outbreak began. Malibu, what about uh, political transitions on the continent? Uh, you obviously had uh, something interesting last year in October uh, by way of Burkina Faso, mm. in Ouagadougou, people power against President Blaise Campayoli, a man who had actually been in charge for 27 good years, having, of course, uh, uh, overthrown and probably assassinated his colleague, mm. Captain Sankara. Well, I, you know, again, you know, I, I think uh, people need to recognize people power. You know, I mean, you can't uh, rule a population and think 
uh, that they're just a bunch of nobodies where you can rule. I mean, Africa is now a, a embraced an inclusive political system, or what now uh, they, they call democracy. Uh, so what happened in Burkina Faso happened in Burkina Faso. But I, you know, I, I, need, I need to talk about this. What do you mean by what happened in Burkina Faso happened in Burkina Faso? Are you suggesting that uh, other Africans may not be able to borrow that template? No, I think the context is different everywhere. It depends on the context. Uh, it depends on the context. I think you're talking about uh, uh, how uh, many people are talking now about uh, changing their own constitution and so on and so forth. Now, uh, I will talk here as a lawyer because I'm an attorney and I'll talk as an attorney. You are a lawyer. But yes. before you tell me that you are a lawyer, uh, you talked about, of course, um, efforts for some leaders to change constitutions. When a president mm. is sworn into power, what, what is he supposed to do first and foremost? Is it not to respect that Const constitution? Absolutely. To protect it? Yes. To defend it? Yes. Is he supposed to change it to favor himself, personally and politically? No. What I'm saying, the, 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 the president of a country is a guarantor, if you could, of the constitution. So he has to defend the constitution. But the problem, and I think this is people are becoming very compartmental about this issue of constitution. You know, the constitution were, are written by people. And sometimes constitution may be changed. I'm not saying that constitution should be changed. You can amend the constitution with an objective to make sure that the inclusive political system becomes stronger in the country. I'll give you an example of the Democratic Republic of Congo today. Look, we have parliamentarians in the DRC. They are voted for five years. The Constitution says they will stay in power for five years. But guess what they're doing? For five years, they sit in Kinshasa every day. They never go back to, to, to see their constituency. Whereas, I think today, if we can change the Constitution to make sure that they're only elected for two years, they will start thinking. So they if will they try to take care of their population. If they go back to consult or interact with the their constituents, then who the, do they in fact represent exactly. in that parliament? That's exactly what I'm saying. So we can't say, no, because the constitution says it's five years and it's five years, we are never going to change that. We need to look at the situation. What is going on in the country and so on and so forth, you know? But, but Mulegua, if, let, let's, let, let's be very honest. Mm -hmm. Who is the primary stakeholder in all this? The population. And how does the population assert itself? Uh -huh to make sure that, in fact, it is the primary stakeholder, it is the boss of the president, it is the boss of the senator, of the member of parliament, of the chief justice, and not the other way around. Look at the Congolese constitution. The Congolese constitution was, uh, you know, we had a referendum in Congo on the Congolese constitution. So the constitution actually belongs to the population of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And if but what sort of constitution, what sort of referendum was it? Was it something, frankly, that uh, you reflect that the results, for example, were reflections of the will of the Congolese people? Absolutely. Absolutely in our constitution. You know, I was one of the people that, that were, was writing the constitution at the time. You know, and, and, you know, absolutely, it's a constitution that was done by the population. Say today the population says, look, this is outdated. Some issues are outdated. Mm. For instance, the, cash, the question I just told you about uh, the parliamentarians in the DRC, they never go back to their constituency. They don't know what's going on with their constituency. They will wait again until we have elections, then they go back to the constituency, vote for me again. Until you have elections. Until you have elections. Are they, in fact, elections? Or are they what some call selections? No, they're not selections. In no, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, you do have these questionable results. <laughs> in fact, you have a sort of fashion where a lot of African presidents talk about holding, these are their words, not mine, periodic elections. No matter whether those elections are a sham whether those elections have been rigged, they are elections. Are, they, are these elections, frankly, meant for the primary stakeholder of these African countries? Or are these elections, frankly, meant to appease 
the development partners of these African presidents? Again, it depends. And I'm going to talk about my own context. I'm going to talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have had... Where with... there are rumors that, uh, you know, that uh, the incumbent may well be in uh, uh, a process of doing what they call shifting the political constitutional goalposts. No, that, again, like you said, these are rumors. But, you know, if you're talking about the, the, the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the president has not said to anybody that he was going to change the constitution. But, you know, people are saying... The but he recently, he recently criticized the outsiders mm -hmm. not to interfere with internal affairs in his country. And he's right. And he's right. And I'll tell you why he's right. I'll tell you why my president is right. Okay? The, the president of the Democratic Republic Congo still has two years on his mandate. He's the only African president today that people, for the past three years, everybody is nagging him as though he had said that he was going to change the constitution. There's no time that he said anything about changing the constitution. But people are already nagging him every day, telling him what to do. I mean, you know, you can advise and so on and so forth, but there is no time where the president of the DRC, he has a mandate. Let, uh, let him finish his mandate for God's sake. But, you know, they won't even let him finish his mandate. They're already talking about his intentions as though they're in his head and they know exactly what he's done. There's nothing the president of the DRC has done to show that uh, he, he, he's trying to change the constitution. He's remained focused on his job. He's remained focused on his vision, which, you know, as you know, when he came to power, the country was in a mess. When he came to, to, to power, he decided to reunify the country, reconcile his people, and rebuild his country. That's what he's been doing. But there's not been at one point where President Kabila has said to somebody, look, I'm going to change the constitution. No. Absolutely not. And this is very unfair to try to accuse him of something that he has not said. I see. I gather that uh, we are now joined by uh, Dr. Henry Gombia. Are you there, Dr. Gombia? I'm very here. I've been here all the time. And uh, very nice to hear from you. And uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to you, too. And, of course, Henry is the publisher and the editor of the London-based Evening Post, an online newspaper uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, Henry... You obviously have been monitoring the continent. Uh, what is the single most important story that uh, you have covered uh, so far? Uh, before I go into that story, I want you and uh, all our people to join us in uh, uh, conveying our condolences mm -hmm. to the journalists who are killed today in Paris, uh, mm -hmm. the journalists from Charlie Hebdo. And uh, we just say, uh, hope that everything can be sorted out and uh, the killers of those journeys are, are found out. Well, the most important uh, uh, comment that I wanted to make today refers to what um, uh, Dr. Manns has been saying about the Africa-U.S. summit. Um, Africa, uh, Dr. Manns says that uh, uh, this summit produced a lot of money billions of investment in Africa. But you see, my problem with that is that it is very good to have that kind of money going into Africa. But when you do not have institutions that can take good care of that money, that money is a waste. I don't know whether Dr. Barnes knows that uh, most of the African, maybe let me correct that, say a lot of African leaders have been using money into their countries for their personal gains. Now, if you're bringing in so much investment into the country, and then that investment is not helping the people of your country, that investment is helping you to stay in power more, to entrench yourself. Dr. Gombia, Dr. Dr. Gombia, um, uh, let's not really generalize. Uh, are you in a position, for example, to name some names here? Of course I am. I can name the president of Uganda, who has used investments to entrench himself, his family, into power in Uganda. I'm not very keen in, uh, about what uh, our, our friend there from um, the DRC is saying, because I can say that I have information that actually the, 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 the president of the DRC is planning to stay. So it is the same happening to the president of Rwanda. Uh, so these are the examples we are saying that the African leaders have got a lot of investment into the country, very good, but that investment has not helped 
anyone there. Look at the, the way they traveled to Washington. A lot of them, most of these leaders, traveled by private, line, private plane. Now, look at the transport infrastructure in Africa, how it is, how a lot of roads are not there. <laughs> There's no <laughs> trains running from town to town. And these guys are going around the world in private jets. We'll come to that guided. later. We'll come to that okay. later, Dr. Gombia. In fact, there, is, uh, uh, there are some pictures which are making... Uh, the uh, social media rounds of uh, the president of DRC, uh, Joseph Kabira, who was stuck uh, somewhere uh, in his country, frankly, because uh, of the rain and there is virtually no road. You are tuned <laughs> into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Mariama Jaro. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media, the stories that has had an impact on them, on them last year and what they're hoping would materialize this year. But now, here is our letter of the week. Patricia Namdi in Kampala, Uganda writes, the Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria and their violation of human rights in the country has been a huge story. Are there any solutions to this problem? People are being killed, boys and girls are being kidnapped. Who is funding Boko Haram? What steps has President Goodluck Jonathan taken to stop this insurgency? What steps has the United States taken to bring peace in Nigeria? Is the insurgency an attempt to curtail the current president from standing again in the forthcoming elections? Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gidui, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. 2014 was a busy year in Africa. Deadly terror attacks and an even deadlier disease left several countries reeling as Ebola swept across West Africa. Many nations faced enormous challenges throughout the year. And this leads us to our question of the week, which asks, what 2014 event or story had the most impact on your life? Well, thanks everyone for using all our social media platform to communicate to us. Let's begin right away with a comment from William Wallet from Juba in South Sudan who writes, The crisis in South Sudan has had a major impact in my life. Thousands have, have been killed and millions more have been displaced. There has been no significant progress in the peace process. Insecurity and fighting continues to severely affect communities and impede humanitarian access across most parts of the country. Another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA2013 Africa Review, VOA2014 Africa Review, rather. And if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. Speaking of it, uh, let's go to a tweet uh, from Afrobarometer. Uh, who writes, quite a bit of them. A major one was the Ebola outbreak, unrest in Lesotho, and also Burkina Faso, and the U.S.-Africa summit. Shaka. What about guess. that, uh, Henry? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it really brings into focus what's happening on the, on the continent. I was trying to think about myself as a 
a professor who has got 54 students in my uh, classroom, and the 54 students representing the 54 African countries, plus two other students who are representing two other states that are not recognized. And I'm saying, I'm tipping up here, thinking about the democracy, democracy during the last year in Africa. The positive signs about democracy in Africa during the last year was what I saw about the elections in Kenya when uh, President uh, Joe, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta was uh, uh, democratically elected. Now, this was one election that has not been the same in Africa for a very, very long time. We had a president very, very seriously elected by the people who love him. I've, I've been with President Kenyatta in uh, The Hague when uh, he was there to attend this case in The Hague about him. And I saw for the first time an African leader who is loved by his people, who people just want to come and see under the door. I haven't seen that anywhere else at all. I looked at the health of Africa in the last 2014. Huh. There's nothing good about the health in Africa. No hospitals. Um, the, the leaders are taking their relatives and uh, children for uh, health checks abroad, not in their own countries. I looked at defense. We have a problem in Nigeria, where there is uh, Boko Haram. Nigeria was supposed, and we believe that Nigeria was the strongest black African country ever in power, in everything. Look at what is being done by this Boko Haram. They are not being able to counter it. And we haven't seen many African countries coming up to say, hey, this is a common problem. Let's make sure that Boko Haram is gone. I've looked at international relations. Africa is still relying so much on international aid. Now, the time that I've spent in Europe here has taught me that the more you rely on aid, the more you are in debt. Now, Africa is indebted to the West because of this aid. The time has come when Africa should learn not to, to, to depend so much on aid. Now, who is the future? The future in Africa, 2015 and on, I think depends on the very African people, the young ones that uh, maybe uh, President Obama is trying to talk about. Those are the future. Those that mostly have come in Western countries, seen how things are being run, seen, seen how democracy is run. These are the, I think, are the future that Africa would like to come down, go back and say, listen, this cannot be done. We don't want corruption. We have to do these things. That's Thank the future you. for Africa. That's everything. Thank you very much. Uh, Mariama, please share some more of the audience feedback. Well, Shaka will move on to a posting uh, from John Ken Siro, uh, speaking of uh, Kenya uh, and Uhuru Kenyatta. This person writes from Nairobi in Kenya. He says, the International Criminal Court's withdrawal of the case against Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta was a big joke. Justice for the victims was denied. And another uh, Facebook comment comes from uh, Okugbu Omunua Igodalo in Abuja, Nigeria, who says, the West Africa Ebola epidemic shows that we as people probably do not think and plan strategically on the continent. Human lives must be our first priority. Shaka and guests. Interesting comments. Well, it looks like uh, Mulegwa, you wanted to go for it, huh? Yes, absolutely. I, I am very surprised uh, from, uh, to hear what I heard from Dr. Gombia uh, because uh, the, the, the view he's giving to the audience now is that uh, Africa is a loom and doom place. Uh, there's Armageddon in Africa, everything is destroyed, there's nothing in Africa. Mm -hmm. That is not uh, correct. Uh, I, I wanted to, to say this. You know, for instance, no, on the no, issue no, of elections. I didn't say that. Uh, right. Allow me one second, uh, doctor. You know, when he talks about election, that the only place where he had seen an inclusive political system where an African president uh, was elected was in Kenya. I mean, I don't know if he's looked at Ghana. There are other countries, he, of course. Yeah, one of could course, talk about Zambia, and, one yeah, could talk Botswana, about uh, South Botswana, Africa, and so on and so forth. Africa. I mean, when he said there's no hospitals, my goodness, some of the best hospitals in the world, you find them in South Africa. Yeah, there but are, I, still, I still think he has a point because, uh, let's face it, man, uh, a lot of African countries, frankly, do not have that kind of infrastructure that you're talking about. In fact, I know for sure in Nigeria, which has the largest economy on the African continent, mm -hmm. when the elite get sick, 
they actually either go to South Africa, by the way, where they end up sometimes being treated by Nigerian doctors, or go to the United Kingdom or come here. And it's not only Nigeria. No, but those are exceptions, not the rule. I and I'm say. sure it happens with elite from the DRC. Well, you know, th those are exceptions. Those are not the rules. If you come to, to, to Congo, do we Is have that, a... That, should be, that seems to be, frankly, the rule for the African elite. For the African elite, the political elite. Yes, but those are exceptions. I think we are talking about exception, and we are not talking about the rules here. You come to Kinshasa, for instance, we have uh, what we call uh, Hôpital de Saint-Cantenaire. It's a huge hospital. It's a state-of-the-art hospital in Kinshasa where people are treated, where myself, I get my treatment there, where many of our ministers get their treatment right there. So, you know, to look... I've, to, I've, to, written, to, about, to, I've written about that hospital myself. I've written about that hospital. I've written about the problem in that very hospital you, you are, you're mentioning. With it, looks like, uh, <laughs> it looks like we might actually need uh, another uh, edition of Straight Talk Africa to talk about some of these things. If, if I could just say something about health. I, I, I think the lesson from what happened with the Ebola crisis is the neglect of strengthening community-based health systems, empowering right. people right. to take care of their right. own health right. rather than relying on hospitals. Mm -hmm. So this is the focus for us, and I think there's an enormous opportunity for effort today mm -hmm. uh, with the development of technology to be able to do community-based surveillance of disease that was completely missing during this crisis. We have a technology partner. We're going to be doing this on the ground in West Africa. Being able to provide at the community level mm -hmm. the ability for uh, health workers who are not highly educated to be able to accurately diagnose disease I hear you. and provide the kind of mm. advice and support that people need to treat themselves. I hear you. So I, I think we have to walk on both legs. That was the sort of infrastructure, frankly, that obtained in my country, Uganda, dispensaries when I was growing up. Mm. Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Thank you, Shaka. Certainly strengthening the healthcare system and hoping that uh, Africa, uh, West Africa, is going to learn from uh, the Ebola uh, outbreak. Well, that will do it for today's uh, social media segment. We look forward to another great year with everyone. And just a reminder, we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please, please keep your thoughts coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Simply subscribe to VOA TV to Africa. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, experts from the Brookings Institution will join us to discuss what they consider to be some of the key issues facing Africa in 2015. That and more next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much and welcome back. Uh, today we are reflecting on some of the top stories that dominated the headlines on the African continent over the past year and a look ahead to what's in store for 2015. Our distinguished guests are Dr. Darius Manns, President of Africare, a non-profit organization based here in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining Africare, Dr. Manns served as Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, or MCC. Mulegwa Zihindura, President of the Center for Political and Strategic Studies and the former spokesperson for DRC President Joseph Kabira. And last but not least, Dr. Henry Gombia, publisher and editor of the London Evening Post, an online newspaper based out of the United Kingdom. He joins us from our studios in London. Well, gentlemen, um, I have to confess uh, we should have had at least uh, a lady, really. But, uh, gentlemen, uh, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. 
It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. You're most welcome. I'm told to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. I gather that we have Tafa. Good evening, Tafa from Ghana. You're most welcome, Straight Talk Africa, and a happy new year to you. Thank you, Shaka. Good evening to you, Shaka. How are you doing? Usually terrific, especially with the new year, Tafa. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish all of you happy new year. I just be you. Thank you very much. We are, we are forever grateful to you. What is your question, Shaka, sir? Shaka, before I make my... Yes, let me make some clarification. One of your guests made some... Uh, a comment about African leaders flying private jets. But I can assure him that my president, since he took over, he has never flown in any study jet, even though he has one. So that, that, that one I want to be clear. Shaka, 2014 was a terrible year, was very, very terrible. You have Ebola, you have uh, killing all over the, the continent. But the most good news we have in, in, in Africa, across Africa, was removal of dictator uh, blessed compound. Shaka, the sad of this is that uh, this, this sad news will continue because you have people who are dictators, they want to remain in power. Look at what is happening in, in our neighboring Nigeria. Boko Haram is killing, is killing people, is killing innocent people. But if you look at what the government in Nigeria is doing, there's no solution. They are rather busy campaigning how to maintain power. Instead of them concentrating how to defend the ordinary citizen of Nigeria, but they are busy campaigning. And, and this is what is going on in my continent, Shaka. Anytime I, I look at my continent, I cry. Because Thank I you. see the leaders who are greedy are only thinking about themselves. They don't think about the people. Thank but you. thank God, my president, your mama, is, is doing great in Ghana here. We are grateful, Shaka. God bless you all. You too, you too. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Once again, let's take a look at Africa 2014, a year in review. On June 2014, U.S. President Barack Obama announces the expansion of his Young African Leaders Initiative. August 2014, the U.S. President hosts the first U.S. African Leaders Summit to discuss the future of the relationship between the United States and Africa. October 8, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta appears before the International Criminal Court. It's the first time that a sitting president submitted to the court summons. On October 21st, South African track star Oscar Pistorius is sentenced to five years in prison for involuntary manslaughter in the shooting death of his girlfriend, model Riva Steen Camp. On October 29th, Zambian President Michael Sata dies and Vice President Guy Scott is elevated to interim president as Africa's first white leader since Frederick de Klerk in apartheid South Africa. On October 31st, the Burkina Faso president Blaise Compaoré resigns after 27 years in office amid violent protests. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook, keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui. Let's go again to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers, and we go to Nigeria. Good evening, Buba. You are most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Shaka. Compliment of the season. 
Well, I'm hugely terrific, my brother, and of course, uh, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored for your compliments. Thank you, sir. My comment, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, 2014 have left us internally displaced in Nigeria. <clears throat> we cannot for forget the issue of what work I came from. I came from Gulag in Madagascar local government of Adama State. And as I'm talking to you now, that place has been occupied by Boko Haram. So 2014, as I'm telling you, I am internally displaced. We lose billions of naira from there. We lose millions of lives. I cannot make mention to mention just few. Now, another aspect I wanted to talk is I cannot forget the issue of uh, the death of Ali Mazuri, Professor Ali Mazuri. We appreciate his writings here, his struggles there in America. We do note it here in Nigeria. Uh, so also, I cannot forget of Ebola. Ebola. We were made to take bath with salt and drink salt for the sake of Ebola, which has been imported into our country. Shaka, there are a lot of others to talk. Thank you. Thank you. We, you'll have another opportunity next time when we do an edition on Nigeria, but I hope that uh, you'll vote very wisely on February 15th. Won't you? Okay, thank you, sir. You're most welcome. <laughs> Let's go to East Africa. Good evening, Dennis from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, my brother, Shaka Sali. You're most welcome to good Dennis. What's your question, sir? Uh, my, I just want to make uh, some comment and maybe a small question. You have a minute, please. I, I am grateful that uh, President Obama has made almost every effort to try to draw African heads of state to try to put them on the limelight and onto the straight line so that they would better their administration back on here. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine, I would imagine whether they have learned anything coming back from us from the United States. I am coming, I am calling from Uganda and what happens in Uganda. I am happy that Dr. Gombia understands what is, what exactly happens in Uganda. Mm -hmm. The question of strong men and strong women still remains a very big issue in Uganda. And Ugandans have still, still failed to understand how to, how to manage their own society and their own affairs. In Uganda, political and elections are only meant to determine which political party is stronger than which one. They have failed to learn whether they should think like a Ugandan, like the Americans do. I want to say that when, America, when an American president wins an election, that is a win for all Americans. But it is funny in Uganda when a president in Uganda wins an election, that is a win for a political party. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. It was a pleasure to hear from you. And, of course, uh, a happy New Year to you. Um, let me come to you um, immediately, um, Gombia. You, you mentioned something about uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, a man I know and a man, of course, I respect and was elected uh, by his people, but uh, there is another point of view, frankly, which doesn't seem to have confidence in the result of that election. Uh, but that aside, what about uh, the situation of the International Criminal Court? Charges have been dropped uh, in as far as uh, Mr. Kenyatta is concerned. What does that say to the victims, the ordinary people? What sort of justice are they getting? President, President Kenyatta himself has said that he was sad that uh, uh, an answer has not been found yet for the victims, and uh, he's sad about it. But you see, the way that the ICC went about this uh, trial was wrong. It was a fraud investigation, trying to buy witnesses, uh, giving them money to, 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 co to go and uh, give evidence into the ICC. And it, in fact, it was uh, one of my very good friends, uh, 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 Dr. Masanga, who went out of his way, a Ugandan went out of his way, to expose the fraud 
that uh, the ICC was trying to bring in into bringing into uh, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. Fraud investigation, fraud people, you cannot be heading an international court and then bring in fraud investigation. It was wrong. What, 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 about, uh, what, what about uh, some critics who are saying that, yes, you may be right in the sense that uh, your friend uh, uh, David Masanga has done a wonderful job, but what about other voices, frankly, which are saying that what has been going on in Kenya is not only intimidating witnesses, but in fact, some have allegedly even been killed. Others have been compromised. Haven't you heard about those reports? There is no, I have not seen them, any evidence. I would have been the very first person to write about those uh, allegations. I have not seen any evidence, and uh, I challenge anyone who's got any evidence to bring it to me, and I will write them, and I will expose them. Thank you. If there has been anything, yeah, I will, I will expose it myself. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Zambia. You had uh, the death of Michael Sata. Mm. You had a smooth transition, of course, uh, uh, from him to... Uh, Guy Scott, uh, who is acting president, and uh, you are supposed to be having a by-election uh, on January, in fact, 20th. Uh, you also had, back in 2008, a death of President Patrick Lev Mwanawasa, mm -hmm. and you still have to go through by-elections. Mm -hmm. Why can't they make an amendment, frankly, that makes things so simple? If you are a vice president, an incumbent president dies, the vice president steps in because Zambia, the last time I checked, is not a particularly rich country, frankly, mm. to go on holding elections. Mm. Yeah, again, you are really now espousing my point of view. You know, when a constitution has flaws like that, those things need to be changed. Yeah, but not, know, in the not interest... a situation where an incumbent president is changing a constitution he's supposed to defend, protect, and respect. Exactly, and that's what I was saying. I said when changes need to be made yes. to reinforce, to rebuild the, cap the, 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 the capacity of an inclusive political system, yes. you should do that. In the case of Zambia, for instance. They you should know, Because do that. they cannot continue holding elections when they don't have money. It costs a lot of money to hold elections. Well, like unfortunately, that. time happens not to be our best ally. Uh, what about you, uh, Dr. Manns? I, I would just say... Word? Last word about this. I think 2014, as I said earlier, is a tremendous opportunity. We saw Africa very much on the spotlight globally. My hope, 2015, Africa takes advantage of this. More than a dozen elections taking place across the continent to consolidate democracy. But we make sure they are elections, not selections. Absolutely right. <laughs> but also, something you said very important, which we should not underestimate, is the power of youth. The age difference on mm. the continent, mm -hmm. uh, being led by average age, 70 plus, average age of the population in some countries below 20. So addressing that gap to have that confidence in the leadership, that's what these elections need to be mm. about. That's mm. what they need to be about indeed. Uh, well, on that note, thanks to our distinguished guest, Dr. Darius Manns, President of Africare, Mulegwa Zihindura, President of the Center for Political and Strategic Studies, and the former spokesperson for DRC President Joseph Kabira. And last but not least, Dr. Henry Gombia, publisher and editor of the London Evening Post. He joined us from our London studios in London, of course. And thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning is Daybreak Africa with James Butte. On behalf of the Voice of America, Thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, please. And remember to keep the African hopes alive.